A very good Sunday morning to whomever turned up here, either voluntarily or as part of the organization. So, I um, first would like to take the opportunity to just um, thank everybody who's here, the crew, Doug, uh, the guys and girls putting uh, Opposition Conference together. It's amazing and fantastic to be here live, in person again, having the ability to rain wet onto my soul yesterday evening, but that's, you know, what happens. Now, but again, thank you guys so much. So who are we? Um, for those of you not familiar with Open Ovations, we are a um, predominantly open source uh, consultancy firm. We do project management, uh, hardware, software development. Um, we um, are pretty active also in the standardization domain, um, part of Etsy, part of um, several uh, industry boards like ISPE are coming up with uh, industrial guidances for how to test and validate pharmaceutical uh, systems. Um, and we have a philosophy, the name of the company is not just in name, Open Innovations, we actually donate 10% uh, of our annual revenue, either in money or time, back to the open source uh, projects and communities uh, that make it possible for us to run our business. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because I would like to make this a call to action for all uh, small, medium enterprise businesses, whatever, whenever you do something with open source, contribute back. And as Open Source's motto at some point was, do awesome stuff and talk about it, uh, because hopefully other people will also start doing that. So, for today, um, I'm going to try and make this not just a product promotional talk, uh, although I'm actually very excited about uh, the Arane product that we are uh, building as Open Innovations. Um, I'm going to go into the background of it, uh, tell you a bit more about the open source uh, components and libraries that are being used in it, uh, tell you about our testing and validation uh, strategy and philosophy. And um, the nice thing about having a, let's say, dedicated, compact audience is that whenever you have any kind of question at all whatsoever, just please interrupt and make this a bit interactive because uh, especially on a Saturday morning, uh, I would rather have a conversation with you people than having here some kind of monologue, which I'm pretty proficient in doing, but please make it interactive. So is anyone here uh, working in the pharma or medical domain or in a clinic or any affiliation with that? No? Okay, cool. You're sort of. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Where, where are the best? Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield, so like national health insurance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, we have quite a number of U.S. Uh, partners and customers in the San Diego uh, life sciences area. It's, uh, Not sure if that's okay. Okay. It's uh, We have a very inclusive policy, so yes, for me it counts. So... In pharma and healthcare, especially in laboratories, um, one of the major headaches for uh, information managers, QA officers, is um, legacy systems. I guess it's a ubiquitous problem for everybody in the IT industry, um, but one of the reasons why it's predominantly problematic in pharma and healthcare is because if you release a product into the market, being it uh, a medicine or a medical device uh, or any type of uh, software or hardware solution, um, especially if it involves uh, clinical trials or validation data, you not only have to keep that data available during the life cycle of the product itself, but especially if it's any form of patient-facing or human interaction uh, kind of appliance, <coughs> there's actually <coughs> um, <coughs> an average um, requirement of 30 years after end of life 
of the product that you need to be able to reproduce any um, adverse event or any clinical trial outcome. Now, in IT, 30 years, you're, you're no longer talking information technology, you're talking archaeology. So this is one of the biggest problems that we have at the moment in, in healthcare, especially as um, we have, as Open Innovations, been working directly with a lot of manufacturers of medical devices uh, and software solutions, and all of them basically run into the same problem, which is we've built this product once, it's amazing, everybody loves it, everybody adopts it, but we as a company at some point will move away from that product, be it for technical debt reasons or whatever other priority change, or even the company stops, stops to uh, operate or ceases to exist. Um, so this, this made us... Um, especially after we were actually approached by various of the end customers of our clients that at some point wanted us to be involved in migrating them out of the software solutions that we built for them at some point, but that their predominantly, uh, predominant supplier would no longer support. So this got us thinking, because um, traditionally Open Innovations it isn't a company uh, that does direct B2B uh, products. We, we build products for other companies that then put that in the market as their product. But we are seeing basically two developments. So first of all, uh, we see a technological development that's in um, uh, not just web development, but also uh, equipment evolution. Uh, standards are coming up. So the nice thing about that is that once you've written an integration with a certain product, you can actually reuse that uh, in different contexts. Another thing is that during uh, the past decades, because we've actually been in business for more than 20 years, um, we have built so many reusable components based on open source components and interacting with the open source community behind it, that we at some point also decided, like, okay, let's just take an inventory of whatever it is we have, slap it all together, and see if that's actually a viable product. So that's where RNA uh, comes from. Within labs uh, and clinics, what usually happens is that some lab manager decides that they need some kind of new UPLC or HPLC or some kind of analysis uh, device that does something with a sample, like filter it, uh, look for pur uh, purity or um, longevity, etc. With these equipment uh, items come IG systems because you want to operate on the data. Uh, of it. But one of the major issues there, at first from an organizational point of view, that is that IT and information management and even QA is usually not even involved in any kind of procurement process until the moment that the lab manager and the lab operators have decided, this is an awesome device, we want that. So their IT department just makes it happen. <laughs> That's of course awesome for, uh, for data. Uh, harmonization and, and stuff, not really. But in general, these uh, systems boil down to something like uh, a LIMS, a laboratory information management system, picking data from the analysis of the devices into a database, basically an ERP with statistical analysis capabilities. And um, what also happens is these LIMS systems usually have uh, functionality for workflow management, like uh, maintenance of equipment, keeping it in a validated state, um, limited inventory management about, for instance, if you have a storage cabinet, uh, what kind of samples do I have in here, what are the environmental uh, conditions in which the samples need to be uh, retained, etc., etc., etc. Now, a challenge there is as you have several of those limb systems side by side because of different vendors of equipment, like you have uh, user packet HPLCs, you have waters uh, and power uh, type systems, you have Agilent, you have a lot of other uh, stuff, is they all have their own information models, they all have their own workflow management uh, capabilities. So the 
uh, standard operating procedures and work instructions that a lab needs to have written down on paper and have their personnel continuously be trained into are all based on the idiocracies of the individual systems. So migrating away from one system isn't just about the technology. The, the real problem is now I have this system that has a certain data model, that has a certain database, that does certain input validations and states, changes and whatever else. All my processes are built based on that. My personnel is all trained to step by step exactly follow those procedures and sign off on that. So whenever I change the system, it's not just the IT component that changes. It's my whole organization that needs to adapt to the structure and the workflow and the whatever other um, uh, functional uh, domain changes being introduced by such a system. So the IT part of it is actually the easiest and the cheapest part. The hardest part is the whole validation and the testing and the updating of the quality management system and the training of the people. Now, <coughs> especially in pharma, as I just mentioned, you have to keep data available for 30 years on average, after the life cycle of a product ends. So whenever you've built your information model and your SOPs on a certain system, you basically have to keep that system alive for 30 years. Now, there are a couple of um, ways to do that. One of the things that we started doing in the early zeros, which is still a practice that a lot of labs actually use, is we just started virtualizing uh, those systems in sandboxes, even less than... I think five years ago, we had a customer that had a limbs based on Windows NT4 that had to be virtualized because they needed to have access to that system. So that, yeah, that kind of was a hint to us, like maybe something's going wrong here. Now, in pharma, you have a couple of problems or challenges, as the euphemism says. Um, it's not just regulatory uh, compliance, but it's mainly that a lot of labs are small medium enterprises, uh, small medium sized enterprises. There, the, I would say the vast majority of labs has about between 50 and 100 lab operators. And that also means that they usually don't have a really um, mature uh, information governance uh, process implemented because they just use what they get from the vendors. And at some point they realize that they're screwed. <coughs> now, that also makes them incredibly resistant to change. <coughs> um, not just because they think it's a lot of work of changing the system, but also because they lack the knowledge of what is actually involved uh, in IT transitioning between systems, updating libraries, and, and all that. And you also have to keep systems in a so-called validated state, um, which basically means that whenever you do an update, you have to test everything. So, where does Aranai come in? We started building Aranai first as a kind of a data warehouse. So, um, organizations we have um, created based on several open source components, um, importers and synchronization modules uh, for data coming from spreadsheets, uh, Oracle, MSSQL, uh, MySQL, um, web services and whatever else. We import all that in PostgreSQL, including uh, views, store procedures, and whatever. And then we generate an app on top of that. Now, that may not sound that revolutionary, because there are actually an enormous amount of no-code or low-code platforms <coughs> that basically claim uh, that they do more or less the same. Um, Sometimes they call it an admin panel, sometimes they call it uh, Mendix or whatever. So what we did before actually even going into the Arana uh, journey was we compared 36, I kid you not, uh, competitors or the, uh, the market space. And they were, the, the only thing that we were looking for was um, projects and products that claim to have a valid application within healthcare. So HIPAA compliance, FDA 21 CFR Part 11 compliance, GAMP, whatever. So whenever they had a mention of such a thing within their uh, product promotion, we, we, we started looking at it. 
<laughs> and to be brutally honest, I got so completely frustrated, demotivated, and basically scared shitless of the fact that actually none of these um, apps or products, in my view, and as a quality assurance consultant in pharma with about 15 years of experience, I think I do have a kind of insight into that. I don't think any of those would come through an FDA or an EMA inspection without some serious problems. Mainly, um, problems start usually already at a workflow uh, um, level. Many systems actually don't really allow you to adapt uh, state or workflows into the uh, SOP steps that you have in your lab. It requires you to adhere to a certain predefined standard, or if they do allow it for you, they are so flexible that they don't really, um, I would say even enforce it, it's more like metadata, uh, instead of having an actual work process uh, in place. Now, um, now I'm gonna have to turn on my Wi-Fi a bit, but, <laughs> Another major problem is the, the validation. None of the existing no-code or low-code uh, or admin panel projects that are out there will help you in any way, shape or form with any way of automated testing at all. One of the things we do is with generating the app, and I'll talk about that a bit later, we not just generate the app, we not just generate all the code interfaces for all the individual tables, but per table per action, we generate a Selenium uh, test case, a Selenium script that does a full test on whatever it is we generate. Uh, change and release management control. <coughs> Most of these apps are very flexible. They allow you to change anything at runtime, at will, uh, change the, the input type of a field, change, add a field here and there, uh, whatever. Super flexible. If you, if you want to get running with a proof of concept for the app, it's amazing. If you want to run it in a tightly controlled environment, it's a nightmare. Because what you have to do is proper release management. You need to keep a, a change log or whatever it is you do, um, including uh, traceability uh, between whatever adaptation you've done and proof that you've also updated your test scenarios, your SOPs and all that. <laughs> the most problematic thing from my perspective as open source uh, enthusiast is vendor locking. None of the commercial offerings allows you in any way to get your data out in a usable format. Sure, they all allow you to export in CSV. I'm so happy with that. Thanks for nothing. So, um, that really was... The, the main reason why we felt that Arana was, was, yeah, basically really an, an, a non-existent uh, niche in that puzzle. <laughs> because what we do is we take any arbitrary data model, any database, any spreadsheet that you have, we turn it into a PostgreSQL database schema, but it's a clone. It's not an adaptation. We do a one-on-one -on -one uh, copy, clone, import, whatever you want to call it, of what is already there. We do a full 100% data verification from source to target. <coughs> and the best part of it is organizations don't have to change almost anything in their work processes because the data structure stays the same. The, the workflows stay the same. The form inputs, the field labels, stay the same. So for them, the, the whole nightmare of having to update their entire quality management system into something <coughs> that the new system wants, you, you can just basically completely avoid. I mean, if you have any screenshots in your work instructions, sure, update them, uh, because the app will look a bit different. But otherwise, the data structure, uh, workflows, input validations, everything um, is just the same. Another thing that we really approach very differently is, um, as I man mentioned, most of the low-code, no-code uh, platforms do a lot of dynamic uh, form generation or whatever component generation at runtime. 
This allows you to change whatever it is in some admin interface and immediately your users can work with it. The downside, the downsides of that is first of all, it's very hard to keep track of whatever has been changed at any point, especially keeping traceability between the IT system itself and the work instructions, etc., etc. <laughs> but from a technological point of view, you'll always end up with some uh, heavy beast of a Tomcat servlet uh, uh, application server that has to do all this uh, dynamic generation of stuff at runtime. So it, it will cache a lot of stuff, so it's not that bad in terms of performance, but yeah, why, why do that? Because what we do is we generate semi-static code at build time. So compare it like I have a Drupal CMS, um, PSP memory limit up to 500 megabytes before I'm able to, to edit one page, or I have a static HTML website. Compare both. Now think about what's easier to secure. Think about what's easier <coughs> to perform change and release management on. And as I also mentioned, from a security point of view, we have a lot of experience in pen testing, in code reviews and all that. The, the lesser dynamic voodoo magic happens at runtime, the easier it is to secure. Because if you just serve static files, there really isn't that much of an attack vector or attack surface in there. As soon as you start running anything that smells like Java or whatever, you are opening up a, a very nice little honeypot for uh, people to work with. And it got a lot better in, in recent years, so I'm not going to claim that Java is inherently unsafe or any of the other uh, popular FUD. It's not, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, development platform, just as C Sharp is or, or as Python or whatever. <coughs> but the point is, in security, um, least privilege least access to information, but also least functionality possible. If you don't have to do stuff dynamically at runtime, don't do it. So what we do is we generate models of a database, we uh, expose them through a REST API, <coughs> and any logic that's being performed within the app, like uh, workflow state changes, input validation and all that, we, we exclusively rely on PostgreSQL. Uh, our database is the single source of truth. We do not have any other logic in any other uh, component, which also makes testing and uh, version management and release management very easy because what we use is Flyway DB uh, for database migrations, which include all the changes uh, in application logic and in the schema. So you have everything in versioning and history uh, in one place. Now, as I mentioned, we don't just generate the models or the UI components, we also generate a full Selenium test suite of everything. <coughs> now, why everything? Um, plausible deniability and cover your ass. What we do is we run a full Selenium test on any query interface that we have, happy flow, negative flow, um, out of bounds inputs and all that, and we take screenshots of whatever happens. Now, you can end up with documents of several thousand pages of screenshots, who is going to look at that? Well, of course, nobody after you've verified at first that it's actually there. But I can tell you that whenever you do have an FDA inspection, and I've sat through many of them, <coughs> coming up with a giant stack of paper of screenshots in every way, shape, or form of your app that you can correlate to your functional specifications about what the app should do, really makes a very happy inspector. And as a lab, you want happy inspectors and healthy patients, or let's say, yeah, etc. But happy inspectors, because otherwise you're going to be shut down. <coughs> so, as I said, fully testable app, data migration verification uh, built in, uh, thanks to Flyway DB uh, and the import components that we have, uh, deployments. Uh, we use Docker containers, so everything there is also versioned in our own registry uh, and pushed, etc. Now, as I mentioned, the validation and testing strategy of a approach um, of 
one-on-one -on -one migrations is just so much easier than doing any kind of data transformation or conversion or um, basically anything that looks different than the original in terms of structure, process, or workflow is going to give you a headache uh, in testing and validation. So what do we have? <coughs> of course, we have dashboard components, and I'll show it in a little bit if I get my Wi-Fi up. The CRUD operations, menus, uh, label search, uh, we implement both role-based and attribute-based access control uh, thanks to PostgreSQL role level security. Uh, we have event notification and integrations with just about any platform that has any API uh, you can think of, starting with SMTP. Yay. Another cool thing that we add, I believe is really cool, is we, from the moment that we import all the data into uh, RNI, in the RNI database, any change is being automatically versioned. So any change of any record in any table automatically creates a version uh, copy of that same record, and that allows you to time travel. Now, this step into the mind of the lab operator with the inspector. <coughs> what usually happens is uh, an inspector will just grab any report from a sample and test procedure that you've done and then tell you, all right, you now prove to me that all your environmental uh, temperature or CO2 or whatever variable was within spec during the moment that you tested that sample. You prove that the person that's doing the test is actually competent and trained in doing uh, the, that particular test. Um, you prove that you stored the sample under controlled environmental uh, circumstances throughout the life cycle, which doesn't only mean the time that it was in the fridge, but also the time that it was on your workbench and the time that it was uh, in, your, uh, in your device being tested. <coughs> now, having said that, having to look up all that one-on-one -on -one in any database is a pain in, in the neck. Um, being able to just time travel back to the point in time that whenever the sample was being tested, you can validate that whatever environmental circumstance was exactly what it needed to be. My personnel was trained at that point in time. The digital signature that we assigned to the report was valid at that point in time. That makes life so much easier. And that's the whole point with labs. Uh, FDA and EMA um, make a very big point of continuous inspection readiness. They can step, knock at your door at every point in time anywhere. So be ready and be able to pull out information for whatever relevant circumstance was happening at the moment that you did that uh, one sample. Now another thing is we, we integrate with everything. Um, we don't have a fixed data model as I mentioned, so <coughs> a lot of the integrations that we do are depending on whatever data structure we get from a different system. Uh, but we have a couple of default integrations and also a couple of default components that we use uh, to do like serial bus integration because the vast majority of lab equipment, whether or not it's a fridge, a freezer, uh, and an IVF incubator or whatever else, they just have serial bus interfaces. So we use an, uh, an, an Omega 2 board, which is an, an IoT uh, board with GPIO, IQOT C, and all kinds of other uh, integrations at a uh, serial bus uh, connection to it, and that's our importing mechanism for anything based on a serial bus. And the other thing that's also uh, standard is it's HL7 Fire, uh, which is uh, patient data. <coughs> so we do um, business with various types of labs and clinics. Um, some of them just produce uh, medicine, they need to be in charge of their controlled environments, but some of them actually uh, process samples from patients. So then you have to integrate with whatever ERD or EHR is there, and that's HR7. Now, a bit more on the technology. Um, we base everything on PostgreSQL because it's bloody awesome. Uh, it does everything for us, as I mentioned, input validation, uh, workflow enforcement, uh, temporal history, versioning, and all that. <coughs> we can do everything with it, and that may sound like to a hammer everything looks like a nail. It, in our case, it isn't, because we really evaluated 
many different uh, varieties also of um, recent developments based on PostgreSQL, like SQL and other things that like add whatever type of GraphQL layer on top of uh, Postgres. And maybe we were looking hard enough, but we really don't see any added value in that at all, because everything's already there. Uh, we just put Postgres on top of it. <coughs> and besides Postgres, well, we run a number of other uh, elements, like the PHP Symphony framework, which we use uh, for all kinds of integrations that they have with, with messaging services uh, and whatnot. <coughs> uh, React admin, React JS, etc., etc. And now the key element that I've actually realized that I forgot to tell all this time, all the code that we generate is open source code. So whatever runs at the customer eventually is theirs. If we work with other development agencies, which we do, they give us a data model, we generate all the code for them, it, from then on it's their code. They can continue working with it, even if the contract with us at some point uh, is terminated or expired or whatever. We, as I mentioned in the beginning, vendor locking, I would say, is the number one problem with any no-code, low-code solution or whatever other thing is there. We do the entire opposite. We, we, I have to admit that the code that generates all the stuff, yeah, that's ours. That, that was my personal investment for many years. <coughs> However, everything that comes out of that is perfectly human readable, usable, uh, open source code using all kinds of open source libraries. And if you want to continue working on that code or even developing uh, components on top of that code, once it's been generated, go right ahead. They'll even give you the Ansible playbooks and all the stuff uh, that actually runs the containers and everything, because we don't believe in limiting uh, customer flexibility from moving away from us. No, we, we, we feel that we have to prove our value uh, and, and keep doing that, because otherwise you'll become Oracle, to just name a random example, which has no base in reality, of course. <coughs> um, so all this is yours. If, if you do business with open innovations, whatever you end up with, what we built for you, is yours. Um, and we can deploy it in basically three flavors. One is we host it for you. Uh, we, we have a partnership with Hetzner uh, for, for uh, dedicated uh, machines running uh, client instances. We can run it on, on the client's own personal private cloud environment. But we can even do it on-premise. Uh, we use Ansible because we can just manage anything with it. We, we can do uh, remote vSphere management. We can do whatever cloud service in there. Just awesome. And that's also great for a customer because when you buy into most of the low-code, no-code solutions, they will require you to run it on their cloud solution, which basically is a black box, which also means basically it's impossible uh, to validate. So... <coughs> Having said that, Arani.app, look it up, please. Um, and um, would you like to see a bit of it, maybe? Yeah? No? Cool. Famous. Oh. Thank you. That made my day. Um, so let's see if uh, my VPN is... Yeah, that's... I need to switch. Yep. Dum, 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 dum. Because as you can see, all the nice little red thingies are there because I'm not connected to my VPN and this thing runs behind the VPN. Because why not? Uh, hello. Thank you. Okay, that does something. 
So in case you're wondering, I, I am actually using OpenSUSE. I really am. This, 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 is, this is not Windows. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I'm, this, it's pretty difficult to read, but this is just a list of containers that we run. It's, um, uh, it's a Postgres container, it's Nginx, it runs uh, our uh, Node.js uh, server with the front end. Uh, code, I have PG admin running at the moment because I'm going to show you a bit of the Postgres uh, database. <coughs> we have our API uh, server running. I also have a MySQL database running uh, because that is the source of the app database that I'm about to show you, which actually is a real uh, laboratory information management system that I and Open Innovation built almost 15 years ago in PHP 5-ish. <coughs> and that was actually still in use until last year at the lab that we built it for. So that's kind of giving you an indication of the dinosaur status of all that. Um, and then uh, I have PHP my admin uh, running there. So let me just refresh, see if that does anything. Much to my surprise, it does. All right, so this is Arani, but let me go to the original system. Uh. <coughs> okay, so this this is a typical example of a lens that happened. And when I say happened, I mean uh, the lab at some point decided, hey, we've got enough of spreadsheets, we're going to move those spreadsheets into a database, but we want to retain all the information in there. Now, that's why you'll see a variety of uh, Workflow-related information, uh, like project, is it even feasible or you want me to increase it a bit? Yeah, right. Is this better? All right, so um, workflow management, uh, project samples, uh, management of chemicals, uh, reagents, <coughs> um, equipment maintenance and all that, that that's in here. So um, just to show, uh, project usually have a code, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, this system was built in a Dojo framework, a JavaScript framework of, let's say, less than modern variety, uh, and then framework one uh, in PHP. And basically, there's information uh, on projects. There's all kinds of. Um, uh, functionality to link to other stuff. Obviously, this is not here. But what I meant to put was, so I have my, my lab project information here. Okay, I also have <coughs> time registration in here. Why? Because this lab chose to also uh, create their invoices from the time spent on the samples in the lab. So they had a spreadsheet for that. And it ended up in this database. Does like time management and even, if you look right here, vacation cards or holiday cards, does it have anything to do with, with the laboratory information itself? No, but this is very typical for, for SME labs. <coughs> they just put everything they can in a single system and then you have to deal with that. So this runs in a uh, MySQL environment. And I, I won't bore you too much, but here are basically the tables of whatever you just saw um, in the, uh, the PHP app. So the projects that I showed, they're basically all here, fills are all there. So the first thing we did um, is convert all that. <coughs> and this is not working. So convert all that in a PostgreSQL uh, database. Is this readable? Barely. Um, just for the example here, I have the projects, 
and the project table is uh, literally identical uh, to whatever was in MySQL because we just copy the schema, convert whatever data type has to be converted into the PostgreSQL equivalent. We verify on import that whatever value is in that field, <coughs> even though it may be a slightly different data type in PostgreSQL has the exact same value as it had in MySQL, which I can tell you is awesome with date and time fields because MySQL completely sucks at date and time fields. Uh, it's a string, but right, never mind. Then we have Arana. Um And I can simply show you, and this is, these are again the same projects, is that same information, is that same fields, and all that. So if I now want to edit anything in here, that basically follows the same structure, fields, relations, and anything that was already there. But not just that, we add a couple of kind of nice little uh, components. Oh, my web sockets aren't working. What we do is, for instance, when we view any record in the database, we immediately just show any um, relation and reference that's there. So you can just click through and carry on where you were, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have uh, dashboard widgets that are being added out of the box. <coughs> we have in-app help, and but in general, you just went from this thing that more or less looks like it happened in 2012 or 2010 with a completely out-of-date stack. You wouldn't even want to run or touch any of this uh, in production anymore to a nice uh, 2020 uh, app with React and all kinds of nice drag and drop functionality and just build your own app. So that in a nutshell, and I think I'm out of time, is a runway. And the nice thing about showing this is usually it's a bit of an anti-climax because, hey, I had this information, I still have the same information. And I can tell you, airline travel and database migrations should both be boring. Basically, that's it. Thanks for uh, staying. <laughs>